Welcome, everybody, to TechSAP Alive. My name is Jim Moore, and I'll be your host this afternoon. I've uh, got a great program today. We're starting a series on balanced mix design, and uh, we've got two programs uh, this month, and we have moved our frequency to twice a month, so we'll be on the second and fourth Thursday at 3 o'clock. That's our new schedule. So this month, we're talking about balanced mix design. Today, we're going to talk about balanced mix design as it pertains to Texas and what we're doing here. So today joining us is the 2021 TechSAPA uh, chairman, uh, Craig Odom with Reese Albert and Ryan Barberak with TechSDOT. Uh, they're gonna be our panelists today and, and help, uh, help explain what's going on. So uh, Craig, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic, Jim, thanks. Uh, really good to be here with you and Ryan and uh, look forward to going through the balanced mix design here. So it's Good deal. How about you? How about you, Ryan? Hey, Jim, doing well, doing well. Um, good to see. You. Good to hear everybody. Yep. I'm glad everybody could join us. Good deal. And yeah. I look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to jump back to Craig. Um, when we talk about balanced mix design, what does that mean to you? And then we'll come back to Ryan. So, Craig, what, what does balanced mix design mean to you? That's a really good question, Jim. Uh, that's it's often a question that's kind of uh, ambiguous at first. A lot of people um, not not really sure what that means. But uh, uh, from what it means to me is uh, that the biggest thing you're trying to do is find a mix that uh, can balance the needs of your rutting resistance and your cracking resistance mm -hmm. uh, in the real world, so that that you can have a pavement that withstands heavy traffic without rutting and survives the best time without crack. And, and that's that's really what the balanced whole portion of a balanced mix design really is and what it means to me now. Um, of course, obviously you hope to try to do that with as low cost and as possible, but that, that's the essentials that I see. Absolutely. How about you, Ryan? You know, Jim, if I had to sum it up in the shortest sentence possible, I'd say using performance-based tests provide a long-lasting, economical, durable pavement. But I am going to take it a step further. And for me, the balanced mix design is a concept. It's a new way of thinking, if you will. Mm -hmm. So historically, I've thought of hot mix as being kind of this pendulum, as you, if you will. Sure. So basically, you're trying to be in the middle, if you will. On the left, you've got rutting. On the right, you've got cracking. And it seems as though, you know, it's a challenge uh, from the standpoint of either you're going to rut or you're going to crack, right? It's very, very challenging to get right in the middle. To me, the balanced mix design completely replaces that ideal of, of this pendulum mm -hmm. and gives you confidence, if you will, uh, that you can produce a mix that is both rut and crack resistant. I like it. I like it. I I, I would agree. I, I think that's a great way of putting it. Um you know, we've been through a lot of different evolutions over the years, um, you know, going back to, you know, the eight, 1890s when, you know, the, the barbers were getting started to the early, early 1900s. And, you know, then in the mid 40s, you know, Marshall came out with the Marshall design and, and TechStot came up with the gyratory design and, and Veeam came up with the Veeam design. And there were all these different ways of doing things. and and you know, we've just kind of got by for a lot of years and we've, you know, some of the old designs had, uh, you know, some some strength parameters or some some flow parameters or some stability parameters uh, over the years. Um, you know, and then we ended up with Super Pave, um, you know, 20 some odd years ago and we're still trying to implement it. And uh, I think the key thing there is we're still learning what we started with super pave is not where we're at now and uh, it was a great concept i mean they they basically hijacked texas's gyratory <laughs> and tweaked it and uh came up with a new way of doing it but uh um you know in in many cases uh you know in the other states that weren't using a uh, texas gyratory already when they went to a super pave, their asphalt contents actually went down. Um, and when we went to super pave here, our asphalt contents actually went up some, which is the direction I think that's going to help us 
uh, in the long term. So adding in some performance criteria in that whole process is a is a really good example. Let's look at a chart here. Um, you know, just another way. This has come out in a number of different uh, publications and or variations on a theme and you know where texas is and and where some of the other states are and there's a lot of ways to do it in balanced mix design that's kind of why we started with a uh with a you know having you guys define it and um you know essentially i i think you'd agree with me ryan that kind of texas is looking at the uh the volumetric design and and we're verifying that with performance kind of that category a uh, version up there on the screen um, and as you as you look down there you know you've got volumetric requirements and then innovation potential and I think as we walk before we run um, you know that's not a bad place to start what do you what do you think Ryan yeah Jim I, I would say that you know I would say we're we're closer to B oh, okay um, and the reason being is because when we talk about the balanced mix design, we have two tests mm -hmm. uh, being proposed uh, that one is telling you about the cracking, uh, if you will, cracking susceptibility of the mixture. Right. The other one's telling you about the rutting susceptibility of the mixture. And so my thoughts are is that the reason why we're closer to B is because we are optimizing that asphalt binder content to ensure that we get the rutting and cracking performance. Okay. 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 Craig, you got a thought there on, uh, on this process? I mean, how, how important is innovation to a contractor? Well, that, uh, Jim, that's a, that's a great question. There's, that, that, that's really high on the importance uh, scale. We, we just, it, when you're innovating here, you're looking at new opportunities, and and if, if you're locked in on really tight sand at, in the specification, you got everything's got to follow these things. That, that, that presents a challenge for mm -hmm. innovation. But however, uh, th there's there's a drawback in some of that innovation. You might find things that don't work. So sure, uh, I know that the text about needs itself and its uh, citizens uh, on the roadways, their assets out there, but not not letting you go too far too fast, creating a problem. But if we grow <laughs> together here, and then we establish, like Ryan saying, these performance values, knowing that, that these tests are a good predictor of long-term performance, right? And when you have some confidence in that prediction, and then that that gives you the ability to start realizing what what's really important and what's not. And that, that gives you some flexibility on the contractor side to, to look at different source options and, and different uh, methods to, to hit those performance metrics mm -hmm. through maybe non-standard or, or uh, practices that might uh, have an innovative uh, opportunity out there. Good. And innovation, good. obviously, is going to be a good thing in terms of cost long term. Uh, you, you, without innovation, you're not going to be able to improve that price point. Uh, but, and so that's, it's a big deal. Um, but it, learn to walk before you crawl. There's, or learn to crawl before you walk. <laughs> so there, we might want to go the other way. That may actually be what we want to do sometimes, but that's that's not prudent um, uh, for anybody. Um, the, the contract community, uh, textile or, or the, the public uh, utilizing these, these highways. So yeah, we don't, uh, we don't want to do the ready, fire, aim approach, right? Uh, I, I think the question mark is, is how fast is that program? Yeah. And we don't know that yet. We yeah. just, just don't know that yet. So, Correct. Correct. Um, but that's, that's will be the interesting part as we progress through this process. Good deal. Hey, Ryan, let's talk about the team uh, that's involved uh, in this effort. There are a lot of people, a lot of organizations involved in piloting the Texas BMD effort. Do you want to, do you want to, brief on that a little bit or what's your perspective on that you bet jim and i'm just gonna finish your sentence it's it's been a pleasure working with those involved and as you can see on the screen you can see an idea of who is all involved with this effort and as you mentioned jim there's a lot of people involved and that's what we need i think for success to have a successful project if you will um you know, I think what's important here is that we partner, which 
when you look at the team effort, you'll see TxDOT, that includes districts, that mm -hmm. includes MTD. You'll see three major universities that we have incorporated in this effort, which includes TGI, UTEP, and UT Austin. You'll see that we have industry, and industry is associations, and it's also various contractors throughout the state. And then we also here recently have formed what we're calling the BMD Working Group that includes members of TxDOT, industry, and academia to help us kind of walk through this, if you will, walk through the data, walk through the results that we're getting, kind of the concepts behind what we're doing, and really trying to understand the process because ultimately, uh, you know, our goal is to, is to define a process and come up with a specification that benefits everyone, right? That benefits all. And what that also does is that it gives us confidence. Sure. It gives the department confidence that this specification that we come up with will provide long lasting payments. And it also in return gives confidence to the contractors and everybody else involved that they can construct, design and place these mixtures. So I think it's a great effort that we're moving towards. This effort began in 2019 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's full steam ahead. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great Great summary there. Craig, what's your perspective on on this? Obviously, you know, having a lot of people involved are, is really helping uh, the idea of, of getting everybody's ideas and bringing some new ideas to the table. And, you know, just so you know, I mean, the, the next X App Alive that will air on the 22nd, we're going to be talking about what's happening nationally. And this is not just a Texas thing. This is a national thing. And even international of 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 a new way of looking at this whole process and again i i'm i'm thrilled uh to see this many uh people uh this the, this number of organizations involved and i know craig you uh as we kind of move into the next slide here um you know we've got a lot of projects coming up we built well we built six so far uh, i believe and we've got six more to build, and there's 12 of them total, and across the state. Um, I know Craig, you're you've got one that's going to be building later this summer. Uh, what's your perspective on at least the work that's been done so far? Well, I think it's just fantastic with all the people that are that are working together. So every time we're meeting uh, throughout this process, there's very open dialogue, and and the the support that's there. Um, it, it's huge and everybody's really rolling up their sleeves to want to work on what really needs to be done. There's a lot of variability or there's a lot of variations of mixed types out there and, and things you're trying to achieve. Um, so the mixture of uh, the, the people from the universities, uh, from TTI, from TxDOT, at both at the materials uh, test level or at, at the local district level, people are, are really invested in this. So everybody's really coming together as a team it's gelling very very well and from our experience we've been we've been real happy so far with the support uh and, and just our everybody's ability to come together and work with a unified goal which is fantastic um, so I, I think it's been very very positive um and uh it, the way the group's working together it looks like we're going to get some really good information before which obviously is the goal Good deal. Good deal. Ryan, uh, what's your what's your what's your thoughts here? You know, Jim, so, you know, again, we go back to the confidence. Right. And part of this effort is in terms of the number of projects, we are uh, proposing 12 projects. As we've said, we've got six projects that are ready down. Mm -hmm. And also not only are they projects, but they also include multiple test sections within each field project. So the idea is to get six more. Uh, hopefully by the end of this construction season. And, you know, we want to scatter these projects across the state for several reasons. Uh, one is it gives us the opportunity to work with several contractors across the state. It gives them the opportunity to build confidence in, in what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. It also gives us an opportunity to take a look at various climates, if you will. So Texas is a very large state, uh, very, very different in terms of climatic regions throughout the state. 
You go west, you get dry. You go north, you get cold. You go east, you get wet, and go south, you kind of stay warm and and uh, and and can can get extremely hot temperatures in some cases. Mm-hmm. And so it gives us a good idea to test this concept, if you will, from the standpoint of both getting confidence from both TxDOT and contractors, and then also taking a look at it because your materials change as you go across the state, right? So this gives us good comprehensive uh, understanding of how this specification can be utilized throughout the state. And so we're, we're, we're going to, we're building these, we're going to build some more, and these are not little sections. These are good runs of production runs. So we're not running, we're not making 200 foot of a section. We're, you know, 500, 600, 700 tons. I think they're trying to almost get a day's production in some of these for all these different variables. So we're really going to be able to tell what's on the ground and then monitor it over at a time. And they're going to, they're taking buckets and buckets and buckets of mix to go back and test. So we've got the pre-work that's all been done. We've got the construction operation that's been done. We've got the post-construction testing, and then we've got post-construction performance. So Really, I think it's a great way of trying to bring the whole thing back around and, and bring it together uh, in the process. So, uh, yeah, great stuff. Let's, uh, in the interest of time, let's kind of keep moving on here. We're starting to see a little bit of um, analysis come out of this. And uh, one of the things that they're doing, instead of just flooding us with a whole bunch of numbers and being involved in this before, you get just reams and reams of data, but they're actually trying to bring this out into, into more of a graphical interface or graphical format. And they've come up with this uh, design interaction plot uh, where we're trying to balance both the rutting, as, as Ryan was talking about earlier, not just swing the pendulum back and forth, but to actually design for rut resistance and crack resistance. And if you look at that little chart that's up there, um, you know, you've got kind of four boxes in there. You've got a, a rutting parameter on the on the vertical axis. Don't get too crazy. Don't get too geeked out about what that number means right now. And then you've got a, a cracking parameter on the bottom. And those red lines are those are proposed lines right now. And they may eventually move a little bit. But what they've found is in order to make these both crack resistant and stable or rut resistance, you kind of need to be up in that left corner. And uh, so Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about that? You bet, you bet, Jim. And just so everybody knows, uh, NRRI stands for Normalization of Rutting Resistant Index. Basically what you need to know is, is that if you're greater than one, that means that you would meet the requirements in our specification. Okay, so what you're looking for there, what UTEP did is they took they took our index, if you will, because they're trying to compare mixed types to mixed types. And what they've done is they made an index out of it. So if we're greater than one, that means that you would meet our current spec mm-hmm. okay, in terms of the number of passes required by spec. And so that's exactly uh, what we're trying to do, Jim, is, is you know, what we're finding is, is that, uh, you know, a lot of our mixtures may be outside of this box, if you will, but it doesn't take a whole lot of changes to the mix design to get us inside the box, if that makes sense. So in some cases, we're simply changing uh, bin percentages, if you will. We're adjusting the gradation so that that way we can increase the asphalt content, a couple of tenths, and that couple of tenths gets us into this green box. Okay. And so. One thing that I think is important for everybody to understand is, is that when you consider the green box, the further you move away from the specification limits, as you mentioned, Jim, Mm -hmm. uh, these are not set in stone. These are still being investigated as we speak. Part of the reason why we're doing the balanced mix design initiative. But I kind of like to think of this as more or less a traffic light, if you will. Okay, so. You know, as we all know, green means go, yellow is your warning to to slow down and stop, and then red is to stop, right? Mm -hmm. And so the way I like to look at this is that you start with green, that's where you land within the green box, if you will. But But the further you are away from those specification limits gives you more warning before you have to stop, 
which the okay. specification limit would be the red light, right? Okay. So I think that it's important that, uh, that we understand that. So we don't want to be designing on the line. That's correct. Right, right, because then there's no flexibility and then it's pretty easy to fall out. Does that make sense, Craig, uh, from your perspective? That absolutely does, because uh, I, I think uh, people that make mixes understand that uh, you can make something in the lab and it'd be nice and uniform when you're mixing that stuff up, but th there's natural variability in production. And, and some of that's allowable uh, variability, but if you're right on that edge, then and now you might have some small deviations that are within the specification, but it, it, it may change the performance out there too. So uh, it's just probably not a good idea to just be right on the edge. Uh, so that, that makes sense. Give yourself a little bit of buffer yeah. would, would probably be a smart thing. And I, and I think that's probably, you know, that's this whole process that we're going to have to figure out is where my mix is fall. If, if this is graphical interface is not, is going to work. And I like the idea if we're going to fall in there, when I make an adjustment, where does it move me? Did it move me up, down, left, right? If I make a couple tense adjustments, how much does it move me, et cetera? When my gradation changes, how much of an effect that's going to have? And that's all stuff we're going to learn uh, through this process. And as we as we kind of plow forward this thing, and uh, let's make it kind of interesting and kind of fun. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's look at the next slide here real quick. Um, this was uh, one of the uh, from the last report that we got, and there there is a balanced mixed design working group. Just to let everybody know, and it's composed of a lot of the same people. We've got contractors, we've got agency folks, uh, we've got uh, the the academia on there as well, and uh, 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 Craig is uh, one of the co-chairs, and, and Buddy Williams is the other co-chair and uh so you know we've got we've got a good partnership of people working on this together as we as we plow through this and we're meeting about every six weeks or so and starting to to kind of dig into some of this data as it's starting to be presented but you know here's that green box again and now it's it's not necessarily square we don't have the same size squares but but this one was actually talking a little bit about wrap and i know wrap's a big issue with contractors and i know wrap's been a it can be challenged if it's not being used responsibly so we want to we want to be sustainable we want to use the material where we can um but uh you know ryan i'd like to get your your perspective on on this uh on this graph yeah, Jim, sure. And that, that was one of the key components of this initiative, right, is to use more recycle without sacrificing performance. Mm -hmm. Basically, what this information is telling us is, is that in this, with this particular mix design and that particular wrap source, um, they were able to go up to 45 percent wrap and still fall within that green box, okay. if you will. Right. Okay. And so. You know, but I think what's also important to know is, is that they've not all wrap is created equal, if you will. Right. So good point. Depending on your wrap source and the properties of that wrap, that is what's going to dictate how much wrap you can put in your design. And I, and I think, you know, one of the things here that they've mentioned there, uh, the optimum asphalt content or the OAC is a reference in here. And, you know, we're not trying to minimize the asphalt content here. We're trying to use enough to make sure it works. So we don't have that information up here. But I bet those asphalt contents are a little higher than uh, what a contractor would normally think for a 30 or, or a 45 percent uh, resale mix, uh, recycle mix. Craig, does, uh, does higher recycle uh, um, interest you? Absolutely. I, I think it should interest everybody um, in, in our world of uh, looking at sustainability uh, it's becoming a huge thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we're taking these mixes off of roads a lot of times and, and being able to utilize them responsibly to put back into the roads uh, it is, I mean, it, it really makes sense. Uh, economic sense. There, there's a lot of things that make sense about that. So, uh, but to do so without sacrificing any performance is the key. Correct. And uh, so th this is, I think this is really good uh, from, from a lot of perspectives because uh, 
once this thing gets gets down to where we know what the numbers need to be, we have some good performance measures there. You can really look at, as, as a contractor. You can look at your the materials that you have, the wrap sources that you have, and, and you can put together something. To, to, to see what you need to do with what you have and you can optimize that wrap content. So mm. um, it, this is this is a good thing. I, I think wrap is a it, it is a key thing that we need to use uh, because that that's it just increases our sustainability and, and it, if it's viable to use it back in in, in our products and our roadways, that's that's really being good stewards uh, of of, of environment and, and dollars and everything else so that it's a great point for uh, sustainability good deal good deal you know as we move ahead with this thing and and um i i, I the one of the things that's that i think industry has always been concerned about uh, from the get-go on this is the time it takes to do some of the testing um and how much work is involved and and you know texas has done a lot of work over the years and TTI has done a lot of work and the other universities with the Hamburg rut tester and, and the overlay tester. And I think, you know, they're, they're two good solid devices. Um, they're ones also being looked at nationally at the NCAT test track and their cracking experiment. And so, I mean, these are not fly by night devices, but, but they do take a little bit of effort to make sure they're run and they do take a little bit of time. And so one of the things that's kind of come out, and, and I think TTI and Fuji, Sal has been been really pushing behind this, is this this other test. And it's called the ideal CT test. And there's actually a couple of variations on that where they're they're taking a sample um, that's compacted in the lab or uh, and they're aging it, or they're aging the material, compacting it, and then they're testing this product. And it's very it's a very quick test. And there's no sample prep. Uh, the sample that you see that's sitting in the jig there on the right-hand side is out of the gyratory. There's no sawing, no no gluing, no instrumentation. They're taking that and compacting that. And then once it's aged properly, they put it in the jig and they test it. And it, basically, it's stick it in and push the button and the test runs and it gives you the output. So. I, I really think that there's value for the contractor. Uh, and Craig, you can weigh in this, and, and I'd, I'd like to get Ryan's experience on this as well. If we can get this to work, this is probably the most exciting thing that I've seen in a while where we're actually, you know, Craig, you can do this while your guys are making mix, and you're going to know today or, or at the most tomorrow, depending on which, which mix we're going to do or which test, where you're at. You know, and and so what, what's what's your thought process on on knowing now instead of knowing in in a week? It's absolutely massive. Uh, so in the contractors' world, uh, one of the biggest things you deal with is risk, um, and risk um, it shows its its head whenever you're talking about uh, you've got product down and you don't have information mm -hmm. on the quality or the the the, the uh, acceptability. Of that product, uh, so something that can help uh, curve the time frame uh, to where it's almost real time data telling you, yes, you're in, things are good, you, you're going to make it. Especially if these are going to be used as key performance indicators, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would I, I would say this would be something that we would think would be almost a must, especially if you're being uh, tested on these from a compliance standpoint or something of that nature. Uh, you would want to know this right away, uh, and and it really, it, it, what it really does is it helps eliminate surprises. So um, from our part, it, it, if we're going to go down this road, we we would be able to test our stuff and know mm -hmm. what we have, uh, and and you're not waiting on test results. It may take some time, uh, especially if you have to ship them off someplace to get them done and stuff. Uh, that's time and that's risk that's sitting on the line where quick runs like this during the production process, if you do discover something's happening, uh, that gives you an opportunity to uh, either stop or tweak or revise or, or do something that's going to curb that risk. So it's huge. Yeah. And, and from, from what I've seen on, on these instruments, uh, they're, they're obviously not giving them away, but uh, they're, they're not 
just uh, out of sight too from a contractor standpoint when you consider that that risk calculation. Good deal. Hey, Ryan, what's your thoughts? Oh, my thoughts, Jim, is that this is a very quick test, very simple to run. It uh, doesn't require gluing like you do with the overlay test. So, so it is a test that we can use to provide real-time information. And I think from the department perspective, that's also just as important because it lets us know what the expected performance of that mixture is. Mm -hmm. And when you take a look at our balanced mix design specification that we have, um, you'll, you'll actually see how we go about including the ideal CT test as part of the cracking test for the balanced mix design. And that includes having a correlation between the overlay test and the ideal cracking test. You will develop that correlation during the mix design stage. As you get into the trial batch stage, you'll basically confirm that correlation and then what you'll end up doing is, is you'll end up switching over to the ideal cracking test during production, because again, we recognize that it is a test that will give us information quickly. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. So if the, if you get into the yellow light or, or, or the, the other areas, then you can always fall back, but you've got that, you've got the confidence in the overlay tester, you've got the confidence in the Hamburg tester. And if these devices can help you, Along the line, we did get a question that came in. Uh, who prepares the mix design um, text out of the suppliers? I think for the the pilot, correct me if I'm wrong, that UTEP is actually doing the design work. Um, combination. Yes, sir, Jim. And, it's, a, it's a combination of UTEP and TTI. And, and TTI. But then long term, this will go back. Once this is implemented, I mean, they're doing that for the pilot. Long term, this will go back and it'll be done by the uh, by the contractor the way it is right now. And, and there'll be a same submittal process, um, you know, that that we currently have. It'll be slightly tweaked. There'll be some more information be uh, granted there. Um, also wanted to kind of get your, get your thoughts on this other test, the ideal RT or this rapid test that would give us uh, uh, an indication of, of rutting um, the CT test, the, the first test that we showed was more of a cracking test, but, but this one, I think this is Fuji's baby, um, from TTI of coming up with a, a shear test with the same size samples. And what you see there is the jig in the bottom and the kind of the stress distribution of the shearing in the top picture on the right, um, you know, kind of graphically illustrated, but will give us an early indication of rutting as well. Um, uh, you know, again, really vital. Uh, what's your thoughts, Ryan? So my thoughts are, Jim, is that uh, we are taking a look at this test as well in our effort. And, uh, you know, I think if it gives us, uh, you know, some idea quickly of the rutting resistance of the mixture, then I think, too, you will see this test as part of the balanced mix design uh, specification in the future. Good deal. Good deal. Had another question come in, said, what did you say is the duration of a single test? Um, now I've not run this myself, but, uh, you know, between taking the sample and I believe you're aging the sample first, uh, either hot, either with either the RT or the CT test, uh, the critical aging test is, or the, the ideal CT test, that time is one of those parameters that we're working out, I believe, the time and the temperature. Um, but I believe they're trying to get that down. Um, you've got to, you've got to, you can't, it's not a 10 minute test. So I believe you're, we're talking about maybe aging it overnight and then compacting the sample and running it. Running it is just 30 seconds. I mean, it's just, you know, once you put it in the jig and push the button, it's very, very quick. So, and then the RT test or the rapid test with the hot sample, um, that's essentially taking mix, uh, you know, from the truck. Uh, I think there's a nominal age uh, to that, um, compacting it, letting it, you know, cool down and then running it. And it's run basically room temperature. So or they, they do need to standardize the temperature. But again, very quick. I can see that being done. If you start mix in the morning, you know by... 10 or 11 o'clock, uh, how that's going. Um, so you'd be able to run that uh, as you as you go along. So, you know, we have um, 
man, time has gone by quickly this afternoon. Uh, I'm sure we could probably spend another another hour on this. Uh, um, but uh, gentlemen, I appreciate the time and your energy and your passion uh, for making sure we, we're making good hot mix out there. Uh, closing comments, uh, Ryan. You know, Jim, I think this effort uh, is, is definitely headed in the right direction uh, to provide, you know, um, more durable pavements. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to work with industry and, and all of our associations and universities and districts. It, it really makes it a very, a very uh, good um, experience, if you will. I think it's going to help TxDOT to build confidence on how to move forward. And I think ultimately uh, it will help to utilize more locally available materials. And so mm. thank you for the opportunity for being able to uh, be here today. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Always, always a pleasure. Uh, I know you are, you guys are busy, busy, busy at materials and test. Uh, Craig, uh, any final comments? Yes, I would just like to say I, I really appreciate uh, being able to be a part of this today. Uh, I want to echo uh, Ryan's uh, uh, comments on uh, the constructed long life pavements. Uh, I think it's just it's it's great that we're able to move the ball forward in this. We talked about the evolution of uh, all the different methods over the years, and uh, it, it's really it's really going to be key to the uh, continued stability of our industry. And uh, the roadways to keep this process going. So, really excited to be a part of this process, and uh, I think it's really going in the right direction. There's a lot more to come. So, good we're deal. excited. Hey, everybody, be safe out there. Um, let's keep making good asphalt and uh, ever forward, everybody. <laughs>